Welcome to Moonbeaming, a podcast about lunar living, magic, creativity, tarot, and more. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, and I'm so honored and excited to be here with you today. Hello. Happy February. How's it going? It's going, right? It's going. I certainly have a lot going on that I wanted to share. Our studio does. We are presenting a class on February 11th with Faria Roshin. We had Faria on the podcast. If you haven't listened to that episode, it is such a good one. We'll link it in the show notes. The workshop is called Writing Nature, and it's for those who want to connect their heart and mind through writing. You can sign up through the link in the show notes. It's going to be really, really good. I cannot wait to take it. It also coincides with Varya's entry for February, for the February full moon in the Many Moons Planner. So that's what I'm loosely trying to do this year. I'm trying to link up the practices and the suggested rituals with folks from the planner so that we can really ground into our practices, our rituals, our magic, and see what happens when we come together to do so. So I really can't wait. The gathering with Blanca last month was incredible, and I know this one will be as well. Also, on February 13th, I am going to host a God spot meditation where we will connect our heart with our spirit or source or aliveness or whatever you want to call the thing that makes you feel most alive. It's going to be lovely. I have been doing versions of this meditation since this year has begun. It's been activating my heart really beautifully and reminding me of who I am, or shall I say, who my spirit is or what my spirit is. And it's been just lovely. And I've facilitated it for a couple of friends and they've really liked it too. So sign up also, you know where. Last, but certainly not least, I am so excited to announce that enrollment is open for a upcoming three week long class I'm facilitating alongside some wonderful folks in March. It's called Art Magic. It is a deep dive into how we create magic creatively, intuitively, and how we infuse art with our magical practices how we infuse magic with our creative practices and how that all reverberates into creating the life we want to live. It's going to be really powerful. It's for anyone who has felt blocked creatively or otherwise, who is ready to intentionally create the next chapter in their lives through ritual, magic, creativity, and community. It's for those who want to have fun. We have a good time. We have a good time. I have a sense of humor. I promise. Uh, It's for folks who want to get messy and experiment and explore through making and also explore the intersections between creativity, spirituality, and what happens if we explore them through different lenses, what happens to our lives, what happens to our intentions and what happens to our reality. We've got some really fantastic guest instructors as well that I'm so thrilled to be learning from. We have Lizzie Silva, Pam Grossman and Edgar Fabian Frias. And I don't think I've been more excited for a series since, well, Um, like embodying abundance, which it was in September, but you know, I'm excited for everything I create, which is the way I would like my life to be. Isn't that the way 
we would like our lives to be. So if this all sounds exciting to you as well, please join us. For those who want a payment plan, now is the time to inquire with our studio. And for any other questions, go to our website and email us. Before I dive into today's topic, I wanted to share some lovers' thoughts that are coming in spicy already, and it's about a review for this podcast. So here's the thing. I've already shared with my newsletter folks, and probably like in other spaces, I'm sure, how one of my wounds for years was bad reviews, personal dislike or hatred directed at me via the internet, you know, from people I didn't know at all, people I'll never meet. And it's not anymore, which is why I can talk about this. I'm, I really only share about things in my life once it's been healed. Uh, If I'm in process around something, it doesn't feel comfortable for me to share, but it doesn't affect me emotionally, mentally, somatically anymore. But to be honest, for years it did. I'm really sensitive. I have rejection sensitivity as part of my ADHD. And so it was a real thing. So I'm not coming from a defensive place with this, like as I'm talking about this, because your opinion gets to be your opinion. Your review gets to be your review. And we all know that everyone's got an opinion and everyone's got a review these days. And I wanted to point out this particular review because of what a lover's year lesson it is. So, and the other thing is I have to go through the reviews to pick folks to enter the giveaway. Usually, to be totally honest with you, I don't read any of my reviews. I don't look at my DMs. I don't Google myself. I have no idea. I don't want to know. It is not my business. But I was, I came across this review and the gist of the review is that they were not okay with the fact that I had a guest on Moonbeaming who is a sexuality doula who is on the ACE spectrum. They were, the review said The review said, like, a sexuality expert who doesn't even have sex, which, of course, I'm paraphrasing, and also that's not true. Like, being on the ACE spectrum is different. Anyway, I'm moving right along. They said something to the extent of, it's things like these, which is why the woo get such a bad rap or the woo isn't taken seriously or whatever. Again, it's a paraphrase. I'm sure you can find the review, have a looky low at it so you can read it with your own eyes. And there are just two things I want to unpack here through the lens of the lovers. The first is, why wouldn't I want to invite on and hold space for those who have different expressions of sexuality. Why wouldn't we want to listen to folks who have been deeply invested in sexuality in expressions of sexuality and sexual healing and who have coached hundreds of other people who've thought about this extensively and written about this extensively and practiced this extensively someone who has interrogated all the intersections. And because of that, they've also understood that they are on the A spectrum because sexuality is a spectrum. It's not static. There's not one way to be with your sexuality. There's not a correct, I'm putting this in quotes, or good, I'm putting this in quotes, way to express or connect to your unique sexuality. There's only the way or the ways 
that feel authentic and nourishing for you. And that goes with anything, whether it's gender or love or spirituality or any other important aspect of our lives. So I found that bit like quite just sort of odd, I suppose, not in a good way, not in a, not in a nourishing way, uh, cause I do love odd things, but, and I also really thought it was telling about that reviewer's perspective and maybe the limitations that are in that perspective. We can hold space for many different experiences of a topic without rejecting those and without immediately jumping to discredit those that are different from ours. Just because it isn't the same definition or experience of what you experience or of what you define, that doesn't then give you the justification to be able to immediately invalidate someone else's experience because people are not a monolith. The second part of this that I wanted to address is I'm not woo. Like I don't identify as woo. Sorry. I just don't never have never will. When we set up a binary that people who believe in intuition or animism or spirits are in quote woo, which we all know is a code name for out there, or possibly I'm putting this in quotes, insane, uh, another code word for not valid. We somehow then legitimize only what? Science, materialism, or lot like logic, I'm putting this in quotes as well, it sets up this very, again, I'm using this word, it just sets up an odd dichotomy. And this is also why I completely refuse the woo label. I strongly dislike that word. You'll never catch me using that word. It doesn't resonate on any level with me, so don't call me that. All day long, we will hear folks say, oh, forgive me for sounding woo, but it's a full moon and I'm feeling a little tired or whatever. Wait, so you mean you're going to discount your body's experience and the information you're receiving from your body? And two, you might be discounting the idea that perhaps we are all interrelated and connected in a universal way. How is that Again, I'm using the word woo, like, how is that invalid? I'm here for the mystical and the mundane. I'm here for the mystical and science. In the past three days, I've listened to podcasts about neurobiology. I'm reading the latest David Graeber and Wenfro book that is rewriting the field of sociology from an indigenous lens. I'm revisiting The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. I'm in QuickBooks. I'm having meetings with my bookkeeper. I'm pulling tarot cards. I'm thinking about strategy in my business. I'm talking to vendors. I'm organizing things and so on and so forth. You know, I have a master's. I have a 3.87 GPA from Smith guess what? Those things don't matter. But to some people, those things do matter, which is why I'm sharing. My point is people are dynamic. And a lot of what we've been told about what is valid or valuable relies on following orders in a way that serves a particular set of people, needing physical proof, needing proof that is valid in the eyes of a particular set of people, needing the approval of those who have a limited scope and perspective on the world, and also needing to prove, needing to prove that you're right, and then that makes someone else wrong, needing to prove that someone else is bad, in quotes, so then that makes you good, and so on and so forth. 
So we already know what the lover's piece of all of this is. It can be both and. The way that we create the binary every day with our thinking, with our language, with our perspective, the way we create labels and expectations and beliefs that limit us and those around us aren't serving us, in my opinion. We can sit with things that trouble us or that we don't agree with and interrogate that. I'll never understand why. Well, I do kind of understand, but let me finish my thought. I will. It's hard for me to relate to. That's what I'll say. Folks who resort to completely discounting someone or something when they do not do or say everything that we want them to, everything that we would do matching to a T. I get worried about those people. I'm afraid that those are the same people that need their romantic partner to fulfill every last desire they have, or their friends to be completely the same as them. Again, this is nuanced. I'm not talking about being okay with transphobes or racist people or people who are actively causing harm to others. I need to always be clear about that. But I certainly do not agree with every last thing my favorite writers and thinkers share. And the things I don't agree with, I can interrogate why with myself and clarify what it is that I don't subscribe to without immediately writing that person off and equating them as a bad person just because I don't agree or because I don't understand it. Because we're not separate. Our judgments don't make us good. They do not protect us. They do not make us safe. I'm putting all of these in quotes. Even if we think that it will, the fact that we are engaging, especially engaging in a charged kind of way, connotes that separation is an illusion because we are engaging. Again, this is nuanced and this is by a case by case basis. Y'all know that I am a survivor, so I take harm and sharing of harm and abuse really seriously, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm simply asking all of us, including myself, hello, to be more mindful of why we are training ourselves to be incredibly judgmental of others and almost waiting for chances to write them off to separate ourselves from them, to form a belief around someone else that we don't even know based on one or two interpretations that we don't agree with. What does that do for us? What does that say about how we treat ourselves? Again, I know I'm taking a detour here, but hopefully this is useful and showing you lovers in real time. And I want to thank that reviewer for being such a great example of all the ways this archetype can show up in real life. Like my sweetheart last night was was saying, you know, if we've become a society where people are getting Yelp reviews, maybe we've gotten off track here, perhaps. Question, right? Last but not least, I want to share this other last facet of lovers and reviews and all of that. And that is polarity showing up. It's funny. Some days in the studio inbox, we'll get emails from someone we don't know. Again, these are people we do not know, never met, never had a coffee with, never gone on a walk with someone we don't know who is so angry about my work, telling us how awful I am as a person, you know, going off on all of the ways that they know that I'm this terrible human being. And then in the inbox, right above it or right below it, there's an email from someone who we don't know telling us how the work has transformed their lives for the better. They had a baby, they found love, they got a 
better job that they liked. They healed trauma right there, like sometimes literally within 20 minutes. I also don't read my emails anymore. Uh, That's something I have not done. But it's just this funny polarity. I can't believe truly either one of them and I can't take on either one of them. So I've learned to be measured and observe. Now, again, I make mistakes all the time. Past me has done things that present me would never do now. And in part, that's like how we learn. We learn by making mistakes and missteps and by taking accountability and learning from them and changing our behavior. That's growth. But what I want to share with you, my fellow sensitives, creatives, which is, is that you will most likely in this life tend to hear from two camps those who love you and adore you and only want the best for you and those who dislike you, who you activate and who might even think they hate you. I know that's a strong word. I'll go back to using strongly dislike. I can assure you, you will almost never hear from someone who's like, "Ah, yeah, they're, they're all right. They're They're pretty, pretty good, you know, in the words of Larry. And you'll most likely hear from either people who see their reflection in your work or your sharing, or from people who cannot locate one ounce of their own reflection in your sharing or in your work. And many of them want to be completely separate from whatever it is they profess to dislike. And we can use this wisdom in our own lives. What do we most abhor? Who do we most envy? This could be an aspect of ourselves that maybe we don't want to connect to or can't connect to on full display in another. Those who we love, who make us feel inspired and make us feel good and help us grow We are connecting to those feelings, those aspects that we have. That's us too. We're encountering the love and the inspiration we hold inside, reflected back to us by another who we believe we're separate from. And sometimes it's easier to give others that credit, right? The other day I said to a friend, I wish you could see yourself the way I see you. And that's one of the reasons why we are here to show one another how brilliant and how beloved they are. And hopefully we get to receive that as well. Okay, I really felt called to share that. Hopefully that was useful for you. And let's get on to our show. Today, we are talking about how creativity helps us make magic, how magic helps us creatively, how they are so intertwined and how they can support us in our spiritual growth and in our own healing and the healing of others. Just my favorite subject ever, or one of them at least. So the first tip I wanted to share is about infusing your work and your offerings and your creations, especially that creative work with magic. It's a witch hack. It is a witch hack. So for the first seven years of my business, I didn't spend a dime on marketing. Even now, I spend very, very little. And Basically, all of that amount is really just to support my friend's work or people I admire's work, like the wonderful Pam Grossman of The Witch Wave or placing an ad with Karina Rosella of the Rise Up Good Witch podcast, both podcasts everyone needs to be listening to, and so on and so forth. My entire business has grown through word of mouth and relationship building. It's grown through the tenants of radical generosity, my intuition, sharing my gifts. As a side note, I will be 
talking a lot about this in spring. I'll be talking a lot about business because I've gotten feedback from y'all that that's what you'd like to hear about. So stay tuned for that. But back to growth and magic. It's also grown because of magic and the quality of energy I put into what I do. For example, every year, the amount of copies that the Many Moons Project has sold that I've created has grown exponentially. For example, year one, uh, six years ago, I made a thousand copies and sold them. They sold out super quickly, like in a month or six weeks. And last year, we sold over 14,000 copies, which for a self-published project that again, barely advertises, it's a substantial amount. And this was all done through word of mouth, relationships, and magic. Now, how does one begin to do this? When I begin a project, I set an intention. I ask that it be for the good and growth of all involved. I ask that it finds its way to everyone who needs it and that each one of those wonderful people discovers one sentence or idea or ritual or spell or contributor or journaling prompt or tarot spread. You know, those of you who have been working with the guides, you understand there's like over a million opportunities for someone to feel supported or seen or encouraged or create a spell that will change their life or a tarot spread that will bring them more deeply into their intuition. Anyway, I ask that for each person who has received the project, that there is one piece of information that restores them, that helps them to connect to their intuition, to their healing, to beautiful transformation. And that's where I begin with that intention and holding that energy and that space. Another magical way that I create is that I connect to my intuition and I create things that are totally unique and original to me and my intuition. I don't plot or plan out my offerings based on the market or what anyone else is doing. I don't look around to see what other people are doing or what other people like. If I did, my inspiration, my intuition, it would shrivel up and I would probably not make anything. I don't think that's the way traditional business is taught. I think that one way it's taught is to look at gaps or holes in the market to to solve a problem or to look around and see what everyone and their cat is doing and then copy that. I don't think that's necessarily the best way to do it. There's this whole aspect of publishing or investors, if you're looking for funding, where you have to go around and collect all the similar titles, similar projects to yours to kind of, I don't know, prove that there is a market for what you are doing. And I get why. And business, traditional business, not all, but some, also has a bit of a looky-loo quality to it. This extractive and theft-based quality, at least from what I've gleaned from traditional business education I've encountered. In some schools of thought or literal instances, like with Amazon, it's downright sharky, like people stealing other people's ideas and what they do to form their business because I guess they think it will work. And so many people wanting something the same is like a sure bet, especially people who will be investing in your work with a lot of money and time and energy might have to be convinced that there's a market for that. You know, when I created Many Moons, nothing like it existed. It was super unique. I created it based off my own practice, my own experiences that I invented and tried for about five years before putting out the project because I wanted to help other people. Now there are dozens of projects like this out there. It's not completely a coincidence. And also, I think this is the time we're in. I think people are waking up. I'm 
happy to inspire others. The world needs more lunar magic. Fun fact, no one owns the moon. We need more and more folks talking about and sharing about how we can live in our own natural rhythms and our own natural cycles because it's healing. It helps us to connect to our intuition, our own unique genius, and because it's natural. Nature is the blueprint, my friends. Follow nature, infuse natural cycles into your life and processes and magic and artwork, and they'll blossom and heal you. They might even heal other people too, which has been one of the biggest gifts and honors of my life. And I also factor in the lunar cycles into my creation. When I create courses, and creative projects, I am thinking about lunations there. The other reason that the Many Moons project became successful in like a numbers kind of way is due to it being pure magic. I'm a witch. The entire process is infused with a particular kind of energy, which is my energy, which is energy that I refine and attune and am aware of. It's magical because I also included other people's magic. And there is that communal, collaborative, and community aspect to it. If you are a creator, whether that's wallpaper or leggings or earrings or teas or herbal remedies or books or poems, if you make things through your magic, through your energy, through your intention, that come through your unique channel that connects you with like-hearted and like-minded people, it's going to be a success. To clarify, I don't necessarily mean numbers wise. Real talk, some of my favorite designs, they've been my least sold in terms of numbers. And real talk, some of my greatest successes are the relationships that have been brought into my life as a result of me sharing my work, sharing my work that is deeply flawed, super imperfect, created with my learning disabled ADHD dyslexic brain. For many years, I had very little resources. I mean, I came from a punk background where you made a zine and you put it out in the same night. No one cared about typos. No one. And that was a real wake-up call when my work got discovered by people who didn't have my similar background or philosophy. Like they got really very upset with my typos. I had hundreds and hundreds of people telling me how upset they were, what a mess I was, and what a failure my work was. Like I said, at the beginning of this episode, I still get this, uh, usually on a weekly basis. But guess what? It already is a failure. I already know it's a failure and it's already a success. I already know it is. I'm choosing to answer my call and follow my intuition and listen to what spirit has in store for me. And in doing so, you can bet there will be failure and there will be success. There is no success without failure. Failure is a construct. So if we are going to create definitions of what failure is in our lives, We better get clear on what it is for us because a typo, my dears, or a neurotypical punk rock queer person who is expressing themselves, it's not, that's not failure. Not in my world. In my world, typos, they're not a failure. Now, not doing the thing, not learning from mistakes, not wanting to refine and attune and transform and grow, for me personally, that's failure. And anything is going to be a success if you are bringing an idea and inspiration into being. If you courted that muse, if you answered the call, if you brought your imagination into material form in some kind of way, to me personally, that's a success. It's also magic. That's why art is magic. That's why creativity like cooking or teaching or creating healthy friendships or whatever it is that you create, it's magic. Anyone that creates something and tends to something and grows something is a creative. 
which means everyone is a creative. So leaning into the unique ways our creativity wants to flow in, wants to be channeled, it's such a profound and spiritual process. It's both this way to see ourselves, to see spirit or our muse or a unique expression by taking a risk, being vulnerable and sharing. It's so lovers. It's so, so lovers. I really encourage you to define your own definitions of success around your creativity and your own spiritual and magical processes. The next way that creativity is magical and healing is that it allows us to access healing timelines and timelines of healing. In a lot of my classes, I've spoken about this belief I have that we are now in a time period where we have access to rapid, rapid healing. We can heal much more quickly than generations before us have. It's an opportunity and it's also an honor and it's also a responsibility. In true air element fashion, which is what the lovers corresponds to, this is because there's so much more technology. There's so much more resource around helping us share. There are so many more people willing to share and to teach than ever before. And so that means more of us have access to it. And it's also a really small percentage, of course, like access to the internet on the planet is still really a small amount. It's also a privilege, obviously. Healing, it takes time, resources, we need space, we need energy, we need safety. I would argue we even maybe need comfort in some cases to heal. Because of that, a lot of healing. It's been reserved for the most privileged, but that's also changing as well as the way we look at healing is changing. You know, you don't need to go on some fancy retreat to heal. You don't need a lot of material things to heal necessarily, right? The same with magic, right? You just need yourself. You need your breath. You need your intention, your imagination, and your energy. What magic and creativity both do is that they can create healing timelines for our past selves and our future selves. In so much of my work, I underscore the importance of developing an intimate and healthy relationship with your past self and your future self. You always want to be giving both of them gifts both of them attention, both of them care consistently. When you buy that extra package of toilet paper or say no to an obligation so you have more time and your schedule three weeks from now, you want to be saying, thank you past self for thinking of me. Maybe try for once a day or a few times a week to give a gift to your future self whether that be your future self one week from now, your future self five years from now, you want to be making decisions, small and large, large and small, that care for that future version of you. Because of course, that future version is you. It is who you are creating now in the present moment, which is all we have. Art and creativity is such a potent form of timeline healing magic, precisely because a lot of the time when we create, we're channeling. So we're connecting to a state I call no time, which is all time, which is where we can create new timelines, heal old ones, and open up to possibilities and levels and layers of consciousness we might not always get to experience. You can do things for your inner teenager here. I made a couple of zines a really long time ago called Diary of a Teenage Witch, and it was meant to connect to that teenage self 
who was so confused and felt so misunderstood and who needed so much healing. And that project was me reaching out to that past teenager and saying, hey, your rage is sacred. Your anger is sacred. I accept and I love you in those expressions, in those states, in your confusion, in your grumpiness, in your suffering. The Many Moons Project was and is also an offering to a past self, that self who was discovering magic, who needed to see different models and different versions of a magical or spiritual practice because I connected with so little of what I read or encountered, to be honest. So the Many Moons Project was and is a lot of things, of course, but also there's information there that my younger self needed. Of course, my intention with the project, like I said, it's also to help others, resource others, inspire others, help others who manifest the life of their dreams, and it's done that. But I've also created it for me. So you can ask yourself, where can my creativity heal my past self? And of course, our creativity can also create timelines of healing for our future selves. What we're going to focus on in that upcoming Art and Magic class is infusing our creativity and our creative process with future self symbols and breadcrumbs on our path and symbology that is intended to create our next phase, our next transformation, our next up level version of ourselves, our next new vibrant timeline. We are going to be focusing on imagining our future through the lens of creative possibility, and we will be bringing that into form in our own unique ways through our own unique inspirations, gifts, talents, and intuition. This is absolutely where I'm focused now in my own life, having done a lot of past life healing. So that's primarily where we will be focusing. Now, so you can think to yourself, what projects or expressions are going to be a gift to the future? Not only for your future self, but to others 30 years from now, 10 generations from now. You can ask, how can I create an easier, more abundant, more magical path for myself and others through acts of creation? Maybe you start a garden. Maybe you join a community garden. It can be anything that will resource and tend to the future self that is emerging and that you are in the process of creating. The last witch hack slash life tip I wanted to share about how creativity can help you make magic is through thinking about what your personal correspondence bank is. Once again, if you've taken a class with me, especially if it's a magical class, but really any class, you will be familiar with this idea. In spell books, in any kind of magical education, there will be assignments to what herbs, plants, colors, crystals, correspond with for a particular use. You'll see with spells, certain ingredients listed for certain kinds of spells because they correspond to what the intent of the spell is if you are working from a sympathetic magical slant, which many of us do. And a lot of these meanings have roots in old folkloric practices to be sure. Witches use them because they work. And also there are scientifically proven correlations with a lot of these tools and herbs. For example, garlic is often used in protection magic and to ward off vampires. And we know that garlic is antimicrobial, meaning it repels bacteria. 
So definitely work with correspondences that are proven and have this charge to them through hundreds of years of use. And also, I really encourage folks to create their own, whether that's born out of your intuition or paying attention to synchronicities. For example, one of my special correspondences is Raven. Ravens show up all the time in my life, especially in important moments. I feel a deep connection to them and it's energy I feel at home in. So I collaborate with this correspondence and I also pay attention to this correspondence in my own life. On that theme, there's this idea of co-regulation with our correspondences. I did a workshop once on co-regulation with tarot cards like two or three years ago. It's this idea that you can call upon particular archetypes in the tarot for resourcing and for guidance. I'll share an example. Let's say you are seeking peace of mind. Maybe the tarot card that resonates with peace of mind for you is the Ace of Swords. Obviously, there are so many other cards one could pick. There's the Four of Swords, the Star, maybe the Queen of Swords. Any of these cards or others might resonate with peace of mind for you, but you pick the card that intuitively resonates with that energy and you meditate with that energy. You attune to those energies. You form a bond with that correspondence, with that archetype. Maybe you put it on your altar. Maybe it's the lock screen on your phone. Maybe you set a timer on your phone for three times a day to meditate with that energy. And that's the energy you practice. And so that correspondence is a symbol. It's a reminder, as well as an energetic container, all its own, that you can connect with and form a relationship with. You can also, like you hear me say all the time, you can ask yourself, what would the Ace of Swords do if you feel like you're in a non-peace of mind situation or you're confused? You can center around that energy. The idea is derived from nervous system healing, where the ask is to co-regulate with someone or something that calms your nervous system, whether it's a tree or a pet is always a good one, like a cat or a dog to cuddle with, or a good friend that you feel comfortable around. And co-regulation, if practiced consistently ends up resetting the nervous system. For some folks, it's going out in nature. For those of you who've done EMDR or even some guided meditations, often the practitioner will ask you to imagine a calm, beautiful place in nature that soothes your nervous system. And that's a form of grounding. So you can do that with correspondences. I will often co-regulate with rose quartz. That's one of my current faves. And just take a piece of rose quartz. You can put it in the bath. You can meditate with it. You can connect to that energy. So you can ask yourself what colors or shapes most resonate with the energy I want to feel like, I want to invite in, I want to reset or reprogram myself with. What actions or activities align with these? How do I prioritize those? How do I make time in my life for those? I think it's so imperative to tune in and to choose your own correspondences because it's directly connected to your intuition, your interpretations, your ancestry, right? That's a big one. Your needs and your unique future and path. A correspondence is already an effective and charged energy. 
They've existed for thousands of years, a lot of them. A correspondence is already a talisman, a symbol, a portal, a guidepost, and an arrow. So in our art, whether that be cooking or poetry or music or visual art or all of the above, we can create these symbols that for us charge us, connect us, and we can be in dialogue with and supported by. One of the guest lecturers in the Art and Magic container, Edgar Fabian Frias, is going to discuss scrying with our art, being in dialogue and connection with our art, and I cannot wait to experience that as well. It's going to be so fun It begins on March 5th. It goes until the 26th. It's on Sundays and on Wednesdays. We're going to have three weeks of magic and art, and I'm planning this to align with the equinox. So just before the equinox, in this new moon time of year, we can plant seeds for seasons and maybe even years to come. You can sign up for that in the show notes. Okay, My dears, that's what I've got. Happy creating, happy art making, happy magic making, happy healing. Bye for now. Moonbeaming is brought to you by The Moon Studio. It is created and hosted by me, Sarah Faith Godestiner. Additional assistance is provided by Hazel Fru. Sound art is by Will Owen. And the show is supported by the Moon Studios Patreon. Thanks so much for your support. If you like this podcast, please rate, review, subscribe, and tell a friend. It's much appreciated. Thanks for being here.